Welcome back to the deep dive. Today we're diving deep into OSHA's stairways and ladders standard. Subpart X. Subpart X, you got yeah. it. Now, it's a big one. I know some of you might be thinking OSHA standards, ugh, as exciting as watching paint dry. Yeah. But trust me, for safety professionals, this one is crucial. It is. It's all about preventing falls, and falls are a leading cause of injuries and fatalities in construction. Absolutely. And the standard you know, it's not the most glamorous one, but it is packed with vital information that can literally save lives. Exactly. So let's get started with the basics. Okay. Where does this standard apply? Well, subpart X applies to pretty much any construction project you can think of. Uh -huh. um, new buildings, renovations, repairs, demolitions. Got it. Even something as simple as painting a building really? requires you to follow the standard for stairways and ladders. Wow. It's pretty broad. Yeah. If work is being done at height on a construction site, Subpart X is the safety net, so to speak. Okay, so it casts a pretty wide net. But Subpart X doesn't just tell us how to use stairways and ladders safely. Right. It actually tells us when we are required to use them in the first place. Yeah, that's a key point. You can't just, you know, assume a ladder is okay for every situation. Right. For example, if there's a change in elevation of 19 inches or more, okay. and there's no other safe way to get up or down, Got like it. a ramp or a hoist, then subpart X says you must provide a stairway or ladder. So no more hopping down from scaffolding that's just a little too high. Right, exactly. And another thing to remember is that this standard doesn't apply to equipment that's already covered under another specific standard, uh, like subpart CC, which covers cranes and derricks. Okay. But for everything else related to stairways and ladders in construction, okay. subpart X is the go-to. Got it. Now, before we get lost in the details, let's clarify a few terms yeah. that often trip people up. Absolutely. Things like fixed versus portable ladders, right. sidestep versus through fixed ladders, right. and those ever important unprotected sides and edges. Yes, clear definitions are key. Definitely. So think about fixed versus portable ladders. Got it. A fixed ladder is permanently attached to a structure. Got it. Think of a ladder on a water tower or the side of a building. Okay. A portable ladder is the kind you'd find on most construction sites, things like extension ladders or step ladders. Got it. That makes sense. We'll get into the specifics of each type a little bit later. Okay. Now, what about sidestep versus through fixed ladders? Okay. What's the difference there? Imagine you're climbing a fixed ladder. Okay. With a sidestep ladder, you have to awkwardly step to the side to get onto the platform or landing at the top. Yeah. A through ladder lets you step directly through the rails, which is much safer. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's all about making those transitions as safe and easy as possible. It is. Now, what about those unprotected sides and edges? Right. You mentioned those were important. This is where things get really interesting. Subpart X uses the term unprotected sides and edges when talking about railing requirements. Okay. So imagine a stairway without a railing or a platform with an open edge. Okay. Those are unprotected sides and edges. Got it. And they're major fall hazards. Right. Subpart X lays out specific guidelines for guardrails and handrails to protect workers from those hazards. So basically, if there's a risk of someone falling, Subpart X requires you to install railings or other forms of fall protection. Precisely. Got it. Yeah. And Subpart X doesn't just cover the stairways and ladders themselves. Right. It also addresses when those safety systems need to be installed. That's a really good point. You're talking about things like fall protection systems, right? Yes. The standard is crystal clear. Fall protection systems have to be in place before any work requiring stairways or ladders even begins. No exceptions. No exceptions. Okay, so no setting up the ladder and then scrambling to install a harness while balancing precariously on the top rung. Plan ahead and prioritize safety from the start. Exactly. And when we talk about fall protection systems, we're referring to a combination of elements. Okay. Like guardrails. Okay. Personal fall arrest systems. Got it. And safety nets. Okay. All working together to prevent falls. Okay, so far we've covered when stairways and ladders are required. Right. And some basic definitions. Yes. Now let's dive into the specific requirements for each type, starting with stairways. Okay. I know temporary stairways are particularly common on construction sites, so let's focus on those. Great idea. Let's start with landings. They're crucial for breaking up long flights of stairs. Okay. And providing a safe space to rest or change direction. So it's not just about slapping together some steps and calling it a day. Definitely not. Okay. Subpart X gets very specific about the size and placement of landings. Got it. 
They need to be at least 30 inches deep in the direction of travel. Okay. And at least 22 inches wide. Wow. And you need a landing every 12 feet of vertical rise. It's like a little pit stop every 12 feet to make sure everyone is safe and secure. Exactly. And speaking of safety, let's talk about the angle of the stairway. Okay. We don't want it too steep, yeah. but it can't be too shallow either. Okay. OSHA says the angle should be between 30 and 50 degrees from horizontal. Interesting. What happens if the stairway is outside that range? It's a safety hazard. Okay. Too steep, and people are more likely to trip or fall backward. Right. Too shallow, and the stairway takes up too much space and can become a tripping hazard itself. Okay. So it's all about finding that sweet spot for safety and efficiency. Got it. Now, another important factor is the uniformity of the steps themselves. Right. The riser height and tread depth need to be consistent throughout the entire stairway. Exactly. No sudden changes that could throw someone off balance. That makes sense. You don't want to be surprised by an unexpectedly tall step. Exactly. And keep in mind that doors opening onto stairways can also create hazards. Subpart X says, if a door swings open directly onto a stairway, you need a platform to prevent people from stepping directly into the path of the door. Got it. So no getting whacked in the face by a door while trying to navigate the stairs. Exactly. Good to know. Now, what about those temporary treads we mentioned earlier? Right. What makes them so important? Temporary treads are common on construction sites. Okay. Especially with pan stairs and skeleton metal stairs. Got it. Pan stairs are basically open metal pans that are later filled with concrete to form the steps. Okay. Until they're filled, you need to cover those pans with temporary treads. Got it. Skeleton metal stairs are similar. Okay. They're essentially a framework of metal supports that need temporary treads until the permanent steps are installed. So in both cases, you're providing a safe solid surface to walk on until the permanent steps are in place. Exactly. Oh. And those temporary treads need to be securely fastened and cover the entire tread area to prevent slips and falls. Makes sense. Yeah. Now let's talk about railings. They seem like a pretty straightforward safety feature. Right. But I'm sure there are some specific requirements we need to be aware of. You're absolutely right. Okay. So when exactly are railings required on stairways? There are two main triggers. Hi. If the stairway has four or more risers, Got it. or if it rises more than 30 inches, okay. then you need a handrail and a stair rail system along each unprotected side or edge. So even a relatively short stairway might need railings if it's higher than 30 inches. That is correct. Got it. And I assume those railings need to meet certain height requirements? You bet. Grab your tape measure. Okay. For stair rails installed after March 15th, 1991, they can't be less than 36 inches high. Okay. Measured from the top surface of the rail to the surface of the tread. Got it. For those installed before that date, they can be a bit shorter, between 30 and 34 inches. Interesting. So a little wiggle room, depending on when the stair was built. A little bit, yeah. Now, what about the space between the top rail and the steps? Okay. Can you just leave that wide open? Nope. Oh. OSHA wants to make sure nothing falls through that gap. Right. So you need some kind of infill protection. Right. This could be mid rails, screens, mesh. Got it. Vertical members yeah. or any other equivalent structural member. Basically, you need to close off that gap to prevent objects or even people from falling through. So no open spaces in that railing system. Right. Now, beyond just preventing things from falling through, yes. those railings need to be strong enough to support someone's weight, right? Absolutely. Think about it. Okay. If someone is falling, they might grab onto that railing for dear life. Yeah, that's true. So subpart X requires stair railings to withstand at least 200 pounds of force. Wow, okay. Applied in any downward or outward direction along the top edge. That's pretty sturdy. It is. I imagine there are also some requirements about the surface of the railing, right? You got it. Okay. The surface of the railing can't have any sharp edges or protrusions that could cause injuries. And it needs to be designed to prevent clothing from getting snagged. So no loose threads. Right. No loose threads or rough surfaces that could catch on someone's clothes. It's all about eliminating those potential hazards. It is. No matter how small. Exactly. Now, before we move on to ladders, I wanted to circle back to landings. Okay. We talked about their size requirements. Yes. But what about protecting those unprotected sides and edges on a landing? Great question. Just like with stairways, any unprotected sides or edges on a landing need to have guardrail systems to prevent falls. Okay. Subpart M, which focuses on fall protection, okay. lays out the detailed criteria for those guardrail systems. Okay. So if we're dealing with landings, we need to be aware of both subpart X and subpart M. You got it. Got it. 
Now let's shift gears and tackle ladders. All right. We've talked about different types. Yes. But one thing that really stands out to me is the emphasis on strength. Yes. I mean, when your life is literally hanging on a ladder, right. you want to be sure it's not going to give way. Absolutely. And subpart X gets incredibly specific about how strong liars need to be. Okay. We're talking about load requirements, testing procedures, and materials. Got it. Let's break it down, starting with those load requirements. Okay. They actually vary depending on the type of ladder. Okay, give me the rundown on the different load requirements for portable versus fixed ladders. Okay, so for self-supporting portable ladders, think of your typical extension ladder. Okay. They need to be able to support at least four times the maximum intended load. Wow. So if the ladder is going to be used by someone weighing 200 pounds, yeah. it needs to be able to hold at least 800 pounds without failing. That's a pretty hefty safety factor. It is. But there's an exception for extra heavy-duty Type 1A metal or plastic ladders. Okay. Those only need to support 3.3 times the maximum intended load. Interesting. What about portable ladders that aren't self-supporting? Okay. Like an extension ladder leaning against a wall. Right. Those also need to support at least four times the maximum intended load. But the testing is done with the ladder positioned at an angle of 75.5 degrees from horizontal. Okay. Simulating a typical leaning position. So they're testing it in a real world scenario. Exactly. Makes sense. Now, what about those fixed ladders we talked about earlier? Yes. The ones that are permanently attached to a structure. Right. Do they have different load requirements? They do. Fixed ladders actually have even higher load requirements okay. because they're exposed to more potential stresses. Got it. Think about things like ice buildup, right. wind loads, right. and even the impact from someone using a ladder safety device. Wow, those are some serious forces. They are. So how do they even test those fixed ladders to ensure they can handle those kinds of loads? OSHA requires fixed ladders to withstand at least two concentrated loads of 250 pounds each. Okay. Placed between any two consecutive attachments. Wow. It's like putting the ladder through a stress test to ensure it won't buckle under pressure. Right. And on top of that, each step or rung on a fixed ladder needs to be able to support a single concentrated load of at least 250 pounds applied in in the middle of the step or rung. That's some serious strength. It is. Now, I know OSHA has a whole appendix dedicated to ladder testing. I do. Uh, appendix A is a fantastic resource if you really want to geek out on the details of ladder testing. Great. We'll definitely point our listeners to that. Okay. But for now, let's move on from strength and talk about the actual construction quality of ladders. All right. Are there any specific requirements for how they should be built? Oh, absolutely. Okay. OSHA wants to make sure those ladders are built right. From the spacing of the rungs to the materials used for the side rails. Okay, give me the rundown on the construction quality essentials. What are the key things to look for? First and foremost, make sure the rungs, cleats, and steps are all parallel, level, like, okay. and uniformly spaced. Okay. No wonky rungs or uneven spacing. And speaking of spacing, there are specific requirements for that too, which vary depending on the type of ladder. Okay. But generally speaking, the spacing should be between 10 and 14 inches. Got it. Consistent spacing makes climbing safer and easier. It does. What about the shape and material of the rungs themselves? Good question. Okay. For individual rung step ladders, okay. those are the ones where the rungs are attached directly to a wall or structure. Got it. The shape of the rungs needs to prevent your feet from slipping off the ends. Okay. And for metal rungs, they yeah. need to be slip resistant. Got it. This can be achieved through things like corrugations, okay. knurling, okay. dimpling, Got it. or even a special coating. Okay, so no more teetering precariously on the very edge of a rung uh -huh. or worrying about sliding off a wet metal ladder. Exactly. Safety first. Safety first. Now, what about those step ladders we see everywhere? Yes. Any special considerations for those? Definitely. Okay. For starters, they need to have a metal spreader or locking device. Oh, but keep the front and back sections open when the ladder is in use. Got it. So no accidental collapses mid-task. Exactly. What if you need to splice a step ladder to make a longer side rail? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. The resulting spliced section needs to be at least as strong as a one-piece side rail made of the same material. Okay, so no weak points in that spliced section. Right. Makes sense. Now, what about the surfaces of ladder components? Okay. Are there any restrictions there? Yes. Okay. All ladder components need to be surfaced in a way that prevents punctures, got it. lacerations, okay. and snagged clothing. So basically the same safety considerations as with stair railings? Exactly. No sharp edges or snagging hazards allowed? Right. And what about wood ladders? Okay. Can those be painted? Nope. 
Osho wants to be able to see the wood grain. Oh, okay. For, check for any defects. Got it. So no opaque coverings are allowed on wood ladders. Okay. Except for identification or warning labels. Got it. Makes sense. Speaking of defects, let's talk about clearance around fixed ladders. Okay. You don't want someone getting their back or foot caught while climbing. Right. So subpart X has some specific requirements for that. Okay, walk me through those clearance requirements. All right, the minimum perpendicular clearance between the rungs and any obstruction behind the ladder needs to be at least seven inches. Okay. The only exception is for elevator pit ladders where a clearance of 4.5 inches is allowed. Interesting, okay. And on the climbing side of the ladder, you need at least 30 inches of clearance between the center line of the rungs and any obstruction. Okay, so plenty of space to climb without getting hung up on anything. Right. But what if you encounter an obstruction that you just can't avoid? There's some flexibility there. Okay. If you absolutely can't get that 30 inches of clearance, okay. you can reduce it to 24 inches. Got it. But only if you install a deflection device to guide employees around the obstruction. Oh, interesting. It's like a little detour sign on the ladder, helping people avoid that obstacle and maintain their balance. Smart. Yeah. Now, what about getting on and off those fixed ladders? Okay. Are there any specific requirements for the step across distance at the top and bottom? Absolutely. For through fixed ladders, okay. the step across distance <laughs> measured from the center line of the rungs to the edge of the landing yeah. needs to be between 7 and 12 inches. Okay. If that distance is greater than 12 inches, you need to install a landing platform oh. to bring it back within that safe range. So it's all about those safe and smooth transitions. Exactly. Now, what about the width of fixed ladders? Okay. Are there any minimum requirements there? For fixed ladders without cages or wells, oh. you need at least 15 inches of clear width on each side of the center line of the ladder. Okay. This ensures there's enough space to climb comfortably and safely without feeling cramped. So plenty of room to move around. Speaking of cages and wells, those are essential safety features for fixed ladders, right? Absolutely. Okay. They play a vital role in preventing falls from fixed ladders. Yeah. And OSHA has very specific rules about when they're required and how they should be built. Okay. Let's dive into those requirements for cages and wells. Okay. When are they actually needed on a fixed ladder? Okay. Here's the breakdown. Okay. If the length of the climb is less than 24 feet, Okay. You generally don't need a cage. Okay. Well, or ladder safety device. Okay. But there's a catch. Oh. Well. If the top of that ladder is more than 24 feet above lower levels, okay. then you do need fall protection, even though the climb itself is less than 24 feet. Interesting. So it's not just about how far you're climbing, but also how far you could potentially fall. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And when the total length of the climb is 24 feet or more, okay. you have a few different options for fall protection. Okay, tell me about those options. You can install ladder safety devices or self-retracting lifelines, along with rest platforms every 150 feet. Got it. This gives climbers a break and a chance to secure themselves at regular intervals during that long climb. Right. Or you can go with the classic cage or well option. Okay. But there are some additional requirements for longer ladders. Got it. So for those longer climbs, you either need specialized safety devices. Right. Or you need to break up the climb with cages, wells, and rest platforms. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now tell me more about those additional requirements for cages and wells on longer ladders. If you're going with cages or wells on a ladder that's 24 feet or longer, okay. you can't just have one continuous cage, or well, for the entire length. Right. You need to divide the ladder into multiple sections. Okay. With each section no more than 50 feet long. Got it. And you need to provide landing platforms at the top of each 50 foot section. So breaking up those long climbs into more manageable chunks. Right. And giving climbers a safe place to rest along the way. Exactly. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of cage construction. What are those cages actually made of and how are they put together? Yeah, I'm curious about that. Get ready for some details. Okay, I'm ready. Those cages are typically made of metal. Okay. And consist of horizontal bands that encircle the ladder. Okay. And are fastened to the side rails. So creating a sort of cylindrical enclosure around the ladder. You got it. Okay. And within that enclosure, you have vertical bars. Okay. Spaced no more than 9.5 inches apart. Okay. So close enough together that someone can't accidentally slip through. Right. Now, those horizontal bands, the ones that encircle the ladder. Yes. They need to be spaced no more than four feet apart vertically. Exactly. So this creates a series of hoops right. that someone can climb through. You got it. 
I'm picturing it now, a series of hoops stacked on top of each other, forming that protective cage around the ladder. Exactly. Okay. And the cage itself needs to extend outward from the center line of the ladder. Right. Between 27 and 30 inches. Yes. Creating enough space inside for a person to climb comfortably. Right. But it's not just about the horizontal dimensions. It's not. The cage also needs to extend above and below the ladder's access points. It does. Okay, tell me about those height requirements. All right, the bottom of the cage needs to be at least seven feet. Okay. But no more than eight feet. Okay. Above the point of access to the bottom of the ladder. Got it. And it needs to have a flare at the bottom. Okay. That extends outward at least four inches. Okay making it easier to step into the cage from below. Okay, so no awkward maneuvering to get into that cage. Right. At the top, the cage needs to extend at least 42 inches above the top of the platform or access point. Exactly. Giving someone enough space to safely exit the cage without hitting their head. Right. So it's a completely enclosed, it is. safe space from the moment you step onto that ladder until you reach the top. Precisely. Now let's compare that to Wells. Okay. Which are a bit simpler in design. Okay. Instead of those horizontal bands and vertical bars, a well completely encircles the ladder, providing a smooth, enclosed space. Interesting. So it's more like a tube surrounding the ladder. Exactly. Okay. And just like with cages, wells need to be free of any projection. Right. And extend outward from the center line of the ladder between 27 and 30 inches. Okay. So they provide that same level of enclosure. They do. What about the inside width of a well? The inside clear width of a well needs to be at least 30 inches, oh. giving climbers ample room to maneuver. Okay. And the height requirements are similar to those for cages. Got it. The bottom of the well needs to be at least seven. Okay. But no more than eight feet above the point of access to the ladder. Got it. So consistency in those height requirements across both cages and wells. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Now let's switch gears and talk about ladder safety devices. Okay. I know these are becoming increasingly popular as an alternative to cages and wells. They are, and for good reason. Especially on longer ladders. Yeah. Okay, so what are ladder safety devices and why are they becoming so popular? Ladder safety devices are designed to provide fall protection. Okay. While still allowing climbers to move freely up and down the ladder. Sounds like the best of both worlds. It is. But I'm sure OSHA has some strict requirements for how these devices are designed and tested. You bet. Okay. For starters, they need to be incredibly strong. Mm. They need to be able to withstand a drop test consisting of an 18-inch drop of a 500-pound weight. Wow, that's one serious test. It is. Okay. And beyond strength, they need to be user-friendly. Oh. They need to allow someone to go up and down the ladder without having to constantly hold, right. push, or pull any part of the device. Okay. The climber's hand should be free for climbing. So no fumbling with complicated mechanisms while trying to maintain your balance on a ladder. Exactly. And maybe the most important aspect is that they need to be responsive. They do. Okay. They have to activate within two feet after a fall occurs. Oh. And limit the descending velocity to seven feet per second or less. That's amazing. So catching the climber quickly. Yes. And controlling their descent to prevent serious injury. Right. There are also rules for the connection between the device and the climber's harness. Okay. That connection can't be more than nine inches long. Okay. Keeping the climber close to the ladder in case of a fall. Okay. Now let's talk about how these devices are actually mounted onto fixed ladders. Hmm. Okay. What are the key considerations for mounting those ladder safety devices? For rigid carriers, the mountings need to be attached at each end of the carrier. Okay. With additional intermediate mountings as needed to provide adequate strength. Got it. This ensures the carrier is securely attached along its entire length right. for flexible carriers. Okay. The mountings need to be at each end. Okay. But you also need to install cable guides to prevent wind damage. Okay. This helps keep those flexible carriers stable even in windy conditions. So you're protecting that carrier from the elements. Right. Making sure it stays put and functions properly. Right. And it's important to note that the design and installation of those mountings and cable guides yeah. can't reduce the ladder's overall strength. Right. You don't want to compromise the structural integrity of the ladder right. in the name of fall protection. Exactly. That's a great point. Now, we touched on ladder extensions earlier. Okay. Are there specific requirements for how those are designed on fixed ladders? Yes. For through fixed ladders, you actually omit the steps or rungs from the extension. Okay. The side rails of the extension need to be flared outward to provide at least 24 inches. Okay. 
but no more than 30 inches of clearance. Okay, so creating a wider opening at the top of the ladder for easier access. Exactly. And if you're using ladder safety devices, that clearance can be up to 36 inches. Got it. Now, what about sidestep fixed ladders? Okay. Are their extensions designed differently? They are. For sidestep ladders, the side rails and the steps or rungs need to be continuous in the extension. Okay. No gaps or interruptions. Okay, so a seamless transition from the ladder to the extension. Yeah, right. Now, what about those individual rung step ladders we talked about earlier? Yeah. Those always look a bit precarious to me. They can be, but OSHA requires them to extend at least 42 inches above, above the access level or landing platform. Got it. Either by continuing the rung spacing or by providing vertical grab bars. Okay, that makes sense. This gives climbers something to hold on to as they reach the top. Smart. And I imagine the spacing of those vertical grab bars needs to match the rung spacing. You got it. Okay. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground on fixed ladders and their safety features. We have. Let's move on to how ladders are used on the job site. Okay. I'm sure Usha has plenty to say about that as well. You're telling me. I'm ready to unpack all those rules and regulations for using ladders safely. Okay. Where do we even begin? Let's start with setting up the ladder. Okay. Seems simple, but there are crucial details that can make all the difference in preventing a fall. Okay, I'm all ears. <laughs> what are the must-knows when it comes to positioning a ladder safely? First off, extension makes sure it extends far enough. Okay. When you're using a portable ladder to get to an upper landing, okay. the side rail needs to extend at least three feet above that surface. Okay. That makes perfect sense. You don't want someone reaching for that last rung and having nothing to hold on to. Right, exactly. Yeah. But what if you're in a situation where the ladder isn't long enough to extend those full three feet? Yeah, good question. Is there a workaround? Absolutely. Okay. If you can't extend the ladder three feet, you can secure it at the top. Okay. To a solid support. That. Something that won't bend or give way. Right. And you need to provide a grasping device at the top, like a grab rail, to give people a secure handhold when getting on and off the ladder. So even if you can't meet that three-foot extension, there are ways to ensure it's still safe to use. Exactly. Got it. And of course, before you even think about climbing, make sure the ladder is clean. Right, of course. Oil, grease, or any other slippery substance is a recipe for a disaster. Safety first. No one wants a slippery ladder. Right. And speaking of safety. Yes. It's crucial to make sure you're not overloading the ladder. Right. Never exceed the maximum intended load or the manufacturer's rated capacity. Right. That means being mindful of both the weight of the person climbing. Yes. And any tools or materials they're carrying. Exactly. Use the right ladder for the job. Right. Don't get creative and try to force a step ladder to act as an extension ladder. Right. Each ladder is designed for a specific purpose. Gotcha. And using it outside of those parameters can lead to serious safety issues. Now let's talk about angle. Okay. I know non-self-supporting ladders, those leaning against a wall, right. need to be positioned at a specific specific angle for maximum stability. Yes. What's the rule of thumb there? Picture a right triangle. Okay. The ladder is the hypotenuse, the wall is the vertical side, and the ground is the base. Got it. That base, the horizontal distance from the wall to the foot of the ladder, yeah. should be about one quarter of the ladder's working length. This creates a stable angle that helps prevent the ladder from tipping over. Okay, so a steeper angle means a less stable ladder. Exactly. Got it. Oh. But you mentioned earlier that there's a slightly different rule for ladders with spliced side rails. Right. Okay. For job-made ladders with spliced side rails, that horizontal distance should be one-eighth of the working length. Oh, okay. So a slightly steeper angle is acceptable in those cases. Good to know. What about fixed ladders? Okay. Since they're permanently attached, I imagine the angle isn't as much of a concern. That's right. For mm -hmm. fixed ladders, the angle should be no greater than 90 degrees from horizontal. Okay, so essentially straight up and down. Exactly. Now, let's say you have to use a ladder on a slippery surface. Okay. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Are there any special precautions to take in those situations? You're right to be concerned. Okay. If you must use a ladder on a slick surface, you need to secure it. Okay. To prevent it from accidentally sliding out from under you. You can also use slip-resistant feet to provide extra stability. Okay. But it's important to remember that those slip-resistant feet are not a substitute for proper placement and securing. Right. You still need to take all the necessary precautions. Yeah. Even with those extra safety measures in place. Exactly. What about using ladders in high traffic areas? Okay. If a ladder is placed in an area where it could be bumped or knocked over by people or equipment. Yeah you need to take steps to protect it. Okay. Either secure it to prevent accidental displacement. Right. 
or use a barricade to keep people away from the ladder. Okay, so creating a buffer zone to keep everyone safe. Exactly. And it's not just about protecting the ladder itself. Right. You also need to clear the area around the top and bottom of the ladder. Yes. No tripping hazards or obstacles in the way. Correct. Good point. Mm. Clutter and ladders are a dangerous combination. They are. And I assume when setting up a non-self-supporting ladder. Yes. You want to make sure both side rails are resting on a solid level surface. Absolutely. Both rails need to be supported equally to create a balanced and stable base. Right. Unless the ladder is specifically designed for single support use. Right. And this might seem obvious, but once that ladder is in place, yeah. don't move or adjust it while someone's on it. That seems like common sense, but I'm sure it happens more often than you'd think. It definitely does. And speaking of common sense, yeah. always use a non-conductive ladder when working near exposed electrical equipment. Safety first, especially around electricity. Yes. Now, yeah. I remember this one from my OSHA 10 training way back when. Never stand on the top or top step of a stepladder. That's a golden rule. Okay. Standing on the top step makes the stepladder unstable right. and increases your risk of falling backward. Got it. And while we're on the topic of things you shouldn't do, okay. never use the cross bracing on the back of a stepladder for climbing. Right. Unless it's specifically designed for that purpose. Exactly. Stick to the intended steps and rungs. Yeah. Okay. So we've covered setting up and positioning ladders. Right. Now let's talk about the actual climbing. Uh, I'm sure there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. You're right. Climbing technique matters. Okay. First and foremost, always, always face the ladder when you're climbing up or down. No turning around or trying to carry on a conversation while you're climbing. Keep your eyes on the prize. Right. Reaching the top safely. Exactly. And remember those three points of contact we talked about earlier? Yes. They apply here too. They do. Maintain at least three points of contact with the ladder at all times. Either two hands and one foot or two feet and one hand. Right. That makes perfect sense. The more contact points, the more stable you are. Right. And avoid carrying anything that could throw you off balance. Yes. No juggling tools or materials while climbing a ladder. Right. So if you need to bring something up with you. Right. Use a tool belt or hoist it up mm -hmm. once you're in a safe position. Great point. Now, let's talk about something that's often overlooked ladder inspections. Okay. OSHA has specific requirements for how often ladders need to be inspected. Right. And what to look for. Yes. Okay. I'm ready for my inspection checklist. Tell me everything. Ladders need to be inspected by a competent person okay. on a regular basis. Got it. And we'll define that term in just a moment. Okay. They also need to be inspected after any event that could have potentially damaged them, like a fall or being struck by something. So not just a quick glance, but a thorough inspection from top to bottom. Exactly. And if the inspection reveals any structural damage, such as broken or missing rungs, split rails or corrosion. Right. That ladder is immediately out of commission. It is. Mark it as defective, tag it with do not use or physically block it off. Exactly. No second chances for damaged ladders. Right. Safety first, always. What if a damaged ladder can be repaired? If the damage is repairable, the ladder needs to be restored to its original design strength. Okay. Before anyone can use it again. Got it. No duct tape and hope for the best. Right. Exactly. Now, you mentioned that ladders need to be inspected by a competent person. Can you elaborate on what that means in this context? Yeah, a competent person is someone who has the knowledge and experience to identify hazards and unsafe conditions related to stairways and ladders. Okay. And the authority to take corrective measures to eliminate those hazards. Got it. They're not just looking at whether a ladder is physically broken. Right. They're also evaluating whether it's being used correctly. Okay. And if there are any potential safety issues in the surrounding work area. So they're really the eyes and ears when it comes to to ladder safety on the job site. Exactly. Okay, before we wrap up this section on ladders, okay. are there any other interesting or quirky things we should mention? Um, things that people might not realize are covered in the standard. There are a few things that come to mind. Okay. For starters, single rail ladders are strictly prohibited by OSHA. Okay. They're just not stable enough. Okay. And just to reiterate that all important point, yeah. always, always maintain three points of contact while climbing a ladder. Two hands and one foot, or two feet and one hand. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Just a couple more reminders. Okay. Never, ever move or adjust a ladder while someone's climbing on it. Okay. And if you're working near electrical hazards, yeah. 
be extra cautious when choosing and positioning your ladder. Okay, I think we've covered everything we need to know about ladders. <laughs> Whew, that was a lot of information. But I feel much more confident in my ability to spot a safe or unsafe ladder situation now. That's what we like to hear. Now, let's move on to the final piece of this subpart X puzzle. Okay. Training. Training, right? Even the best designed ladder or stairway won't prevent a fall if people don't know how to use them safely. You're absolutely right. Training is crucial. It is. So what exactly does OSHA require in terms of training okay. for employees who use stairways and ladders? It's pretty straightforward. Employers are required to provide training for every single employee nope. who uses stairways and ladders on the job site. Got it. No assumptions, no shortcuts, everyone gets trained. So no, assuming that people just inherently know how to use a ladder safely. Exactly. Oh. Training is mandatory and it needs to be comprehensive. Okay, let's break it down. What are the key elements of this required training? What topics need to be covered? The training needs to hit on several important points. Right. First and foremost, employees need to be able to recognize fall hazards in their work area. Right. They need to be able to spot those potentially dangerous situations before they turn into an accident. Right. It's all about developing that safety awareness. Exactly. And beyond simply recognizing hazards, yeah. employees need to know how to properly set up Right. Maintain and take down any fall protection systems they might be using. Right. So making sure they're using those harnesses and lifelines correctly. Right. And of course, training needs to cover the proper construction, use, placement, care, and handling of all types of stairways and ladders. Got it. It's basically a comprehensive rundown of everything we've been discussing today. Right. They need to know how to choose the right ladder for the task. Yes. Position it securely. Climb it safely right. and inspect it for defects. You got it. And speaking of inspections, yeah, the training should also cover maximum intended load capacities for ladders. Okay. Employees need to be able to determine how much weight a ladder can safely support. Got it. And lastly, they need to understand the OSHA standard itself. Right. They need to know their rights and responsibilities when it comes to stairway and ladder safety. It's about empowering them to work safely and confidently at heights. Exactly. Now, this is a lot to cover. It is. Is this just a one-time training session, or does OSHA require any refresher courses? Training isn't a one-and-done deal. Okay. OSHA requires retraining for every employee. Okay. Whenever it's needed to ensure that they retain the knowledge and skills from the initial training. Okay, so keeping those safety practices top of mind. Exactly. Safety is an ongoing process, not just a box to be checked. Absolutely. So true. We've covered so much ground today. I feel like we've gone from OSHA standards, snooze fest, to, wow, subpart X is actually pretty fascinating. Right. And life-saving. That's a great way to put it. It's all about shifting that perspective yeah. and seeing these standards not as tedious rules, but as crucial tools for creating a safe work environment. Absolutely. What are your final thoughts or takeaways from our deep dive into subpart X? What do you hope our listeners will take away from this episode? One thing that really stands out to me is the emphasis on proactivity. Subpart X isn't just about reacting to accidents after they happen. Right. It's about anticipating hazards and putting those safety measures in place before anyone steps foot on a ladder or stairway. I agree. It's about fostering a culture of prevention. Exactly. And that's where training plays such a vital role. Well-informed employees are empowered employees. Right. They're more likely to recognize hazards, follow safe practices, and speak up if they see something unsafe. So true. Well, it feels like we've scaled the summit of Subpart X, or at least given our listeners a solid base camp to start their climb. I like that analogy. Right. But remember, this was just a high-level overview. Right. We encourage everyone to delve into the full OSHA standard 1926 Subpart X and Appendix A to get all those nitty-gritty details. And don't forget to share any interesting or surprising takeaways with your colleagues. Spread the safety knowledge. Absolutely. The more we share this information, the safer our workplaces will become. Okay. We're officially signing off on this deep dive into OSHA's Stairways and Ladder Standard. Okay. Until next time, stay safe out there.